thanks very much. It's a great honor to be here. Thanks for the introduction. So I'm going to talk today about what it means to represent. So I'm a professor at Cal. I live in Berkeley. So clearly, I represent Berkeley. Woot, woot. <laughs> so I'm from New York City. I grew up in Brooklyn. And so clearly, I love to represent New York. Woot, woot. <laughs> Go Giants. But another part of me is from India. My parents came from India just a few years before I was born. But I never really knew what India was all about. You know, I grew up in, in New York, in the United States. And the only exposure I had to India was when my parents took a trip every three or four years, or when we were at family parties. And I really understood what India was about. So in 2000, the tender old age of 26, I decided to figure out what it meant to represent India. And so I moved to India. Uh, I had just finished my master's in computer science, and so I had completed a major life stage. My mom was cool with it. And so uh, I, I, at that point, I was reading a lot of Gandhian literature. I was getting very <coughs> infatuated with the ideas of Mahatma Gandhi, and so I went online, and I found a university that was founded by Mahatma Gandhi that taught computer science. And so I sent an email and had some correspondence, and they gave me a job at 8,000 rupees a month, 250 bucks a month, to go and teach computer science in Ahmedabad, India, in, 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 in my home state of Gujarat. And so with that, I went, packed up my bags, flew off to India, and started teaching. So here I am at 26. This picture is funny in a number of ways for those of you who know India. So this getup I have, it's, it's khadi. It's homespun cotton. And I thought it was awesome. I had been reading a lot of Gandhi. He was a big fan of homespun. But all of my students thought this was hilarious. Basically. You know, they didn't, had never seen someone younger than 65 wear anything like this. <laughs> and so they, but I didn't, I didn't care. I thought it was cool. I rolled around on my motorcycle and my khadi. I thought it was fantastic, you know? And, <laughs> and so here I am in India teaching. And so the other thing Gandhi was a big fan of was the local language, the vernacular. And so uh, all of the classes in this school had to be taught in Gujarati, the local language. And so here I am in khadi teaching computer science in Gujarati, and that was not surreal at all. It was awesome. And so there I was, and so I was having a great time. And around this time, I met Professor Anil Gupta. So Anil Gupta is an inspiration to a lot of people, including myself. He's given his own TED talk. This is a picture of him from TED India. And he was a major inspiration for me. And so Professor Gupta's work, what it's about, to really summarize it, it's about finding the mad scientists, the geniuses, the innovators, but in rural India who are working in really, really small villages in innovative ways, kind of the mad scientists, the oddballs, the, the weird ones, the creative ones. And he finds these people, he recognizes them, he connects them, he gives them basically the infrastructure and the ecology they need to succeed. So I thought this was fantastic, so I immediately wanted to work with him. So the first thing I did with Professor Gupta is I went on this trip called the show the author, no doubt inspired by Vinoba Bhave and others, so in this trip, Professor Gupta, with his whole contingent, walks from village to village and tries to find these people, these crazy mad scientists. He has meetings. He tries to find out who's got the crazy great ideas. He has them talk about them. He, he brings along innovators from all over India that come with him on the trip. They go to villages. There's academics. There's crazy foreigners like me. And we're all just walking from village to village. And here's a picture of us you know, walking. You know, they just see this crazy crowd of people, so other people join in. And it's just this really, it, it, it's really an amazing experience and, 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 and quite, uh, quite, quite, quite inspiring. So on this trip, I made two really good friends. And so these are my friends, Bimsi Bay and Narayan Bay. And we immediately got along. So first of all, we all had, you know, I'm from New York, and so we all had a cynical sense of humor. So immediately we connected at that level. Cynicism was a big theme. And we were the oddballs of the oddballs. You know, we were not even able to sit through the meetings. We would immediately say, hey, you know, we've had enough of this meeting. Let's just go sit in a field somewhere. So we would sit in a field somewhere, and Narayan Bay would cut a piece of sugar cane, and we'd all be sitting and chewing it, and we'd just talk. We'd talk about the world, you know, what was going on in politics, current events. Uh, Bimsi Bay, you know, he told me, that he, you know, he hadn't had a lot of education. He basically had a seventh grade education. But at some point, he had gotten his hands on an autobiography of Abraham Lincoln. 
And so he had read this, and he was just infatuated by Lincoln, his humble upbringing, how he had fought for the common man. And so every night, you know, we would sleep in these farmhouses. It was cold, it was the winter, and so we would all be cuddled up, you know, 50 farmers cuddled up into a farmhouse. You could imagine what that was like. Awesome. And so, <laughs> and so you know, he would be telling me as we were going to sleep in this cold farmhouse in the middle of India about Abraham Lincoln. <laughs> and this was not at all because we were all just curious about the world. And Bim Bay was as curious as anybody in this room. He just was really curious about the world and how it worked, how it was organized, how people got ahead in the world, what was the, the latest in technology and innovation. And we immediately became friends. One of the really popular pastimes of these two guys was, let's feed the foreigner a random plant. And so <laughs> we'd be walking down, and they'd say, that, that plant, that's edible, but you eat it first. <laughs> So here you see Narayan by pointing to the plant saying, you should eat this. <laughs> so, you know, this was a really amazing experience. We became really, really good friends. Uh, later on, I went to visit Bim Sibay on his farm. He, he lives in Titori, Titori in Gujarat, in the Saurashtra region of Gujarat. And so I went to visit him, and there I found out that Bim Sibay was not only a very funny and very smart guy, but he was also an expert farmer. So this is him on his farm. He's an organic farmer, and this is his... Uh, Mugfari, farm Mugfari means ground nut. And so he is respected by all of the farmers in this area for growing really, really good Mugfari, using organic techniques. Um, he's got another little part of his farm that's like a garden. He grows amazing fruits, guava, papaya, chiku, mangoes, just a great place to be. And when he goes on the Shodhyatra, he collects plants from every part of India he's visited plants them in the garden, see if they grow, see how they compare to the plants of the native area. So again, just really, really curious and very, very expert in what he did. And so Professor Gupta had a vision. His vision was, how do we connect the Bimsi Bays of India? The oddballs, the mad scientists, the creative ones. Now, does this sound familiar? Right? It's the internet. So remember, this is 2000, right? This is 2000. And at this point, the internet was just getting popular here. I mean, it wasn't a big deal. Only the really crazy people like us were using it, right? But at this time in India, especially in rural India, the, ind the internet was far from anyone's mind. You know, there was only basic phone connectivity, landline, copper line connectivity. Computers were still really expensive. And so no one had really thought that computers and the internet could be a mechanism for really reaching out to farmers in the way Professor Gupta wanted to do. But Professor Gupta had this dream. He had this vision of connecting the mad scientists, the innovators, the grassroots innovators of India using the power of information technology. And so right after he got back <coughs> from the show, the Atra, I come back to visit Professor Gupta and said, wow, I had a great time on that trip. I really want to work with you. And so Professor Gupta finds out that I'm a computer scientist. And he is amazed and psyched. He's like, oh my god, you're a computer scientist. Listen, man, what we really need is we need real-time video conferencing, real-time language translation, real-time knowledge sharing, and all of this needs to be done in six months because I've got a grant. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm the man for the job. <laughs> so we, we didn't make it all the way there, but you know, here we, you see one of the systems we built, basically a kiosk-based internet system. But the computer scientist in me realized that what Professor Gupta was describing was really a 25-year vision. It was a research vision. It was a whole agenda that was required here to achieve that amazing dream that he had in his mind. And to really address it, we had to go about it systematically. We had to make small steps to try to get to this point where this would be a feasible alternative. So I realized two things, that, that we really had to make two simplifications to make this work. First, computers were just still too expensive too hard to manage, too hard to support, too hard to uh, really effectively deploy to village locations. And at the same time, as other people have said, mobile phones were just exploding in their popularity. So since 2000, in India, the uptake of mobile phones, the use of mobile phones by farming communities, by others, has been just dramatic. And so that was a device that everybody had ready access to. And the other thing that was really great about it is to be able to use it, all you had to do was really be able to make a phone call. And so that was really a, a skill that many, many people had practice with and wouldn't be a big stretch for them to do, start doing other things while, while making phone calls. 
<clears throat> the other thing I realized was that the internet didn't start with search. The internet didn't start with Facebook. The internet, the social properties of the internet, started with just really simple community systems, discussion fora, mailing lists, groups that people use to form community. Um, it's really, really appropriate that I'm giving this talk in Berkeley because one of the first examples of such a system was implemented in Berkeley just a few hundred yards from here. It was called Community Memory. It was basically a discussion fora that was deployed in uh, record stores, post offices, where people could post messages for the Berkeley community, buy and sell things. And that was really the progenitor of systems that were really, really very successful in forming community and sharing information. Uh, if, for those of you who remember dial-up BBS systems, the Usenet, just all kinds of systems people use to share information and build community on the internet. And so with these two simplifications, I really thought that that was the way to go for building the kind of system that Professor Gupta had in mind, at least for the next step. So it really took me six years to get back to this vision. In between, you know, kind of life occurred. Uh, I got married, you know, I had got my PhD, I became a professor, I started working on some other projects related to mobile phones, data collection, and in short, just got distracted. <clears throat> but in the meantime, uh, right after I came here to Berkeley, uh, my first PhD student, Neil Patel, you see a picture of him right there, he came to work with me in 2008. And he really brought a fresh set of eyes. And he, Neil, his family, just one generation back, still are farming in India. And so the first thing I did is I hooked Neil up with an organization called DSC, Development Support Center. This is a picture of DSC. That's the staff. That's their office. And DSC, they, one of their main activities was that they produced a weekly agricultural radio show. Uh, this had on-air celebrities uh, that talked about agricultural topics, had question and answer, uh, told, sent out announcements about weather, important topics for farmers. And for an hour, this is a 15-minute show, and for an hour after the show, one of the on-air personalities would leave his cell phone on and let people call in. And this was amazingly popular. People from all over Gujarat would call him, try to get in touch with him, and so they would get a busy signal because so many people were trying to call. And so I thought, what could we do to make this more accessible to people, to give people more opportunity to connect and get this kind of information. So the first thing Neil and I did was we built a simple voice-based message board that people could call in with their mobile phones, ask questions, <coughs> connect with other farmers, and this became a system that DSC used to manage conversations and to manage their, uh, to connect people together. And so the system was very simple. You called up and you navigated a simple interactive voice response system, not very different from what would happen if you called your bank. आपने कोई प्रश्न पूछव सारू आपने प्रश्न पूछवो छे खेती विषय प्रश्न नोंधावो होय तो बोलो खेती वंस यू कॉल्ड इन द मेसेजेस वुड कम इनटू एन इनबॉक्स सिमिलर टू एन ईमेल इनबॉक्स दैट यू माइट हैव फॉर मैनेजिंग योर ईमेल एक्सेप्ट दिस वाज मॉनिटर्ड बाय अ मॉडरेटर दैट वर्क फॉर डीएससी एंड द मॉडरेटर वुड बी एबल टू लिसन टू द मेसेजेस टू रिस्पॉन्ड टू देम एंड इफ देयर वाज नो इजीली एक्सेसिबल रिस्पॉन्स दे कुड फॉरवर्ड दिस मेसेज to another farmer in the network, an expert, an agricultural scientist, someone that worked for them, you know, someone they knew was really great at farming, mugfari like Bimsibai. And so they would forward the message to him. He would be sitting at his house. He would get a phone call at a time that was convenient to him, and he would, the, the message would say, hey, Bimsibai, you've got the following questions waiting for you. You can either answer them, or you can forward them to somebody else that you might know that might have an answer. In this way, you can expand the network, you create some properties of, of viral uptake where other farmers who the, maybe the system didn't know about or DSC didn't know about were being engaged in the system and you were getting more and more uh, good content. <coughs> Finally, if you had an answer or a message that was just important to a lot of farmers, let's say, for example, there was a, 
an issue that affecting the cotton crop for the year, you could also broadcast that information to all of the cotton farmers in the region. So anyone who had asked a question about cotton would get this message that said, hey, it's really important for you to know this. And then they could also respond, and in that way you get simple voice discussion threads. The same way you have discussion threads on mailing lists, discussion fora, et cetera, et cetera. So we've had this system uh, running in Gujarat, in India, with DSC since 2009, and we've literally served hundreds and thousands of calls of farmers with their, an with their questions and with information being delivered to them to their phones. So I wanted to illustrate how this system has been working, just to resu a few of the questions that, that have come through. Mare kabatni kedi karvi che karu vatavaran saru so the questions range from the simple to the technical. To the simply sublime and indescribable. So this is a very popular folk song from India. So this guy, he called in and he recorded six versions of this song <laughs> until he found one that he was happy with. Now that's an artist. That's a real artist, right? And so uh, after that, you know, we, this system was just really successful and we, Neil and I, we started a company in India to basically provide hosted voice content and hosted voice discussion boards to any organization in, or community in India that would want it, right? And so now in India we have uh, a number of partners that are hosting community discussion boards in different parts of India covering different topics, including agriculture, organic agriculture, and ranging from other things like education, human rights, health, and then all kinds of applications just like we have discussion for here for other topics. And so this has been a really exciting journey. In some sense, it's uh, the story of a real big part of my life. And so uh, what did I learn from this? And so one of the things I really learned is that simple is beautiful. Uh, nothing what I've described to you today is complicated. Nothing is complex. In engineering, I'm an engineering by training. I'm a computer scientist really glorify the complicated and the complex, things that only we can understand. Somehow that makes it hard, somehow that makes it deep. But that creates a blindness within us, a blindness to the real simple but useful solutions that are right under our nose, that are in some sense obvious, right? And so I think one thing that I've learned is that the system I built is really simple, but it works, and that's the important metric that I go by. Another thing I learned is that it's really important to pick a challenge that resonates with you, that resonates with your identity. So I have an identity of being Indian. I have also an identity of being a really goofy and odd guy. And so having the system that would help Indian farmers, and particularly the goofy and odd Indian farmers, <laughs> it just spoke to me. It was something that I wanted to work on. It, every day I'd get up and be like, yeah, man, let's do this. And, and that, that was really important, to have that kind of motivation every day to go to work and to keep at it. Because when you're working on a hard problem, a real hard challenge, it takes a long time. And, and as my friend Nipun likes to say, it takes more than a lifetime sometimes. He likes to say he works in the eight lifetime time frame. I've only got one, but, but I'm doing the best I can. And so you really need a problem that motivates you every day and for a long time so that you can keep making progress on it. The last thing I realized is that one thing that really annoyed me about international development is how much we presuppose to speak for other people, what their problems are, what the solutions to those problems are, how do we, prior, how do we assess whether or not those solutions are successful, how to allocate resources, what to talk about. And one thing that I've learned through this work is that when you set out to represent someone, and that's what really what we're doing, we're representing other people, their visions, their dreams, their decisions. It has to be a very, very thoughtful process. And more than anything else, the best way, I think, to represent someone is to let them speak for themselves. 
Thanks very much.